Educators Lead, Episode 8. Assume best intentions always that people are working really hard every day for kids. Welcome to Educators Lead, where we interview leaders in education to offer inspiration and practical advice to help launch educators into the next level of leadership. I'm your host, Jay Willis, and I want to thank you for subscribing to our show. This is John Lee Dumas of EO Fire, and you're listening to Educators Lead. Let's join my friend Jay Willis and get ready to take your leadership to the next level. Hello, Edu Leaders. Jay Willis here, and I'm excited to introduce our featured guest today, Dr. Robert Dillon. Robert, are you ready to launch? I'm ready to launch. All right. Dr. Robert Dillon is currently the director of the Research Institute at Bright Bites, a national education think tank dedicated to promoting innovation and best practice in all classrooms. Prior to this role, he served the students and community of the Afton School District as Director of Technology and Innovation and has served as an educational leader in several public schools throughout the St. Louis area over the past 20 years. Dr. Dillon has a passion to change the educational landscape by building excellent, engaging schools for all students. He looks for ways to ignite positive risk-taking in teachers and students and release trapped wisdom into the system by growing networks of inspired educators. Dr. Dillon serves on the leadership team for Connected Learning, a St. Louis-based organization designed to reshape professional development to meet today's needs. Dr. Dillon has had the opportunity to speak throughout the country at local, state, and national conferences and to share his thoughts and ideas in a variety of publications. He's the author of two books on learning best practices called Leading Connected Classrooms, and the other one's called Engage, Empower, Energize, Leading Tomorrow's Schools Today. He's supported by his wife and two daughters and spends the remainder of his time running, reading, and cycling. That's just a brief introduction, Bob, but tell us a bit more about yourself. Well, uh, yeah, Jay, thanks for having me, and um, it's, uh, it's, it's a pleasure to talk to all of the leaders uh, as a part of this, uh, and you know, I, I always talk about classroom leaders, building leaders, district leaders. Uh, if we don't all wear that leadership hat, um, we're never going to make it anywhere, but uh, yeah, my career's been a great one. I've got a chance to serve uh, you know, folks not only here in St. Louis, uh, and kids and teachers and leaders, uh, but it's just been, it's been a great path. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a learner at heart. And so I kind of take on that role of kind of learner and servant no matter what I'm doing. Hmm. That's great. So tell us a little bit more about uh, the journey itself to becoming a school administrator. Yeah, I, I worked in a, uh, as a high school English teacher and journalism teacher, um, and I really loved that for a number of reasons as I look back 20 years ago and say um, the kids were really engaged in something they were passionate about. Um, they were putting together the school newspaper, they were taking pictures, they were out gathering stories, they were writing about things they were passionate about. And so I think that's why I love that job so much. But more than that, I I found that there were other teachers that truly were begging for someone to listen to them, take care of them, and kind of remove friction from the system. And I, I have a strength in that area. And so very quickly after teaching for three or four years, um, I had an opportunity in that district to be an assistant principal. And I jumped into that role. Um, and I don't know why someone would hire a 25-year-old assistant principal, but they did. And, um, you know, I never looked back. And so um, I was very, very blessed that first year to have a principal and two other assistants in a middle school with a 1,000 kids um, that had a, all had about 20 years worth of experience. And so they really were incredible mentors to me those first couple of years. Hmm. So did you kind of always know that you were going to go into school leadership or, or is that kind of the point, I guess, just seeing the need, was that the point at which you decided or what was that point? I yeah. Guess? You, yeah. It, it's, it's funny, you know, I, it's, you know, 20 years ago, 10 years ago when people said, you know, uh, did you love being a teacher? I said, I really liked being a teacher. I wasn't very good at it yet. Uh, but what I did know was that I, I, I brought people together well. 
I facilitated conversations. I got people excited about things. Kind of some of those real rudimentary things that uh, school leaders need to do. And so, you know, just like I tell anybody else these days, go work and have a career where you have strengths. And um, I, I just, it, it fit and the timing was right. And so um, I, I don't know that I always knew that I was going to be a school leader. But um, I, once I saw what a school leader did, I saw that some of my strengths overlapped there. And so uh, I, I, I look back and now I'm not as uh, reticent to tell teachers that I was really, really excited to be a leader. Um, and so and, and I've enjoyed that role ever since and kind of have worn it um, in a whole bunch of different ways. Yeah. So somewhere along the way from teacher to administration, I'm sure there are some ups and some downs. Uh, what would you say was one of the most difficult moments on the journey, like as you were pursuing that school leadership? Yeah, you know, I, I kind of learned on the job. So I almost kind of count my first years as assistant principals as part of my journey to becoming a leader. But I remember walking into a staff meeting um, and there was about a 30 minute conversation about whether we should have kids chewing gum in classrooms. <laughs> And I was getting frustrated and frustrated and frustrated. And I said something like, you know what? If we spend as much time talking about instruction around here as we did gum. <laughs> and about the time that came out of my mouth, all I wanted to do is suck the air back in and like, you know, hit the button on time and reset things. <laughs> and um, I was definitely an overzealous, like, you know, you know, calling people out, telling people how I thought it was supposed to be with zero wisdom, uh, kind of early administrator, and yeah. it got me into some trouble. And so uh, that um, those were some of the early downs, I would say, as that were part of that. <laughs> so, w were there any specific moments that stood out? Like, I'm sure that you know, between, I mean, where were you at in life at that point? I mean, was it you know, after you made the decision, were there more classes that you had to take, and how did you juggle that with everything else you were doing? You know, with with your day job, you know, as you were pursuing yeah. that. Yeah, I was really lucky. I worked on my master's and my doctorate while I was still single and didn't have kids. Oh, nice. um, yeah, and you know, I two of my really good friends uh, just earned their doctorates this week. You know, both of them have three kids in the house. Both of them have a loving wife. Both of them have jobs that have them going, and um, I really was able to avoid that, um, and so that worked out okay. Uh, but you know, I, I think back also, Jay, like in those first couple years. There were some really incredible moments mm -hmm. that um, I latch on to. I was an assistant principal um, during 9 11, mm. and I remember that day very specifically. I bet. Um, and having to walk around and talk to teachers and let them know what was going on and figure out communication strategy and, you know, make sure that kids got home and got safe. And, you know, um, even. And in St. Louis, you know, certainly not what was happening in New York City by any means, but, um, you know, we're the home of Boeing, mm -hmm. uh, a lot of folks in the defense industry, a lot of folks in the military, um, a lot of folks uncertain of what was going on. But I just remember that being the part of leadership that has nothing to do with learning, mm -hmm. but everything to do with people. And I think that that taught me a lot about the fact that good leaders have to take care of the stuff, but really nurture the people. And right. I, I look back on that day as being kind of a transformative one in my leadership career. Yeah. So kind of backtracking just a bit, when you were talking about just some of the struggles and, you know, being overzealous, which I think I'll probably all of us can relate to because, you know, I don't know if, if you'd coin it like the rookie syndrome or what it is, but sometimes when you just, when you're passionate about something, you get really excited. And like, I'm sure those more, more seasoned people kind of look at you and roll their eyes and you're just like, okay, yeah, let's just wait until yeah. you've got a few years of experience and then we'll, we'll talk about that, you know? Um, but what are some things, I mean, maybe that specifically you wanted to address or maybe just something else, but what are some of the biggest lessons that you learned from some of the struggles on the path to becoming a school administrator that that maybe you uh, you wouldn't be the same person if it hadn't been for those struggles. Like, can you kind of mention some of those? Yeah, sure. I think one of them has to do with listening, and I have become a much better listener over time. Um, before, I think I was always in that mode where I just needed the other person to stop talking so I could reply. <laughs> uh, okay, I'm not listening. I'm just waiting for you to stop talking. Right. <laughs> Uh, but that has made me become a better leader, and I, I give my wife a ton of credit for that. She's a, a licensed social worker, 
And I've watched her work her magic uh, with our kids and in her work and being able to really facilitate growth through listening. And so that being a piece of the puzzle. And then uh, I think a couple other things. I think that um, I've learned how to make time for both uh, things that are urgent but also things that are significant. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of leaders can get caught in the to-do list Mm. but never get to the vision never get to the important conversation, never get to the informal conversation that's important that day. So that that's a piece of the puzzle. And then um, realizing that knowing that this conversation may not be the one that changes someone long term. As an assistant principal, you're meeting with a student, they're excited, they're mad, they're angry, things happen at home, things happen at school. That moment may not be where you make change, but mm. that could be the moment where you're never able to make change in that student. Mm. If you destroy that relationship, if you respond in a way that's hurtful and without compassion, um, sometimes you have to play the long game with students. Mm-hmm. And I think even that first year I go back and think, man, I talked to some really tough students and that really were struggling. and. There was a moment where I took a whole bunch of file folders that all this discipline piled up in it and threw it across my office. And this veteran administrator came in and said, well, I guess today wasn't a good day. I guess we're going to have to do better tomorrow. And it was just that like, there's going to be a tomorrow. Yeah, you're right. And so, you know, I need to get my act back together. And so I I definitely remember that as a, a growing piece too. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so much of what you're talking about. When you we're talking about just communication, I've learned a lot just in uh, my wife and I've been married for ten years now, and so many times when you were talking earlier, just about waiting for the other person to stop talking, just so you can kind of say what you want to say, and just the, especially in a marriage, just uh, in order to have that healthy relationship, and for the other person, really most importantly, for the other person to feel heard, and then also a lot of times you'll miss something if you're just constantly thinking about what you want to say. And so, yeah, that's been a lesson, uh, kind of a, I'm constantly learning that actually. It's not something that I've kind of arrived. And I don't think, yeah, none of us arrive on that one. I don't think. Yeah. So what, I I know you've been in school administration for a while, so I'm sure you have some really amazing stories to share, but what has been one of your, if you could just kind of take us to one point in time that was one of your most, uh, one of your best moments as a school administrator, um, just one of the most memorable ones that stand out to you. Yeah, I, I actually it actually happened recently, uh, which is kind of interesting. Um, you know, oftentimes we don't see the fruits of our labors, right? Like kids come through a middle school, you think maybe you got them on track, you don't know. And, you know, I have students now that are in their 30s, right? right? And, and, you know, they have children, they have their teachers. And um, mm-hmm. I walked into a Panera uh, the other day. And have you ever noticed when you walk into Panera, you don't look at the person at the cash register often. You're looking up like, ah, what am I ordering right. today? So you look up and you're like, I want the pick two and I want this. I, so I do that. I look down at the student who actually was one of my former students standing there. And we both had this look on our face like, I know you and I know you. And she smiled and it was this moment. She didn't even have to say anything. And she was like, I made it. I survived. Huh. A uh, really, really, really tough student. I always tell the story that I spent three years trying to figure out a job where you just yelled at people because she was really good at yelling at people. Um, and like adults, kids, she yelled at a lot of people. And I'm like, if I can just find a job where she yells at people, I'm going to find the right place for her. Um, and, you know, a lot of anger, a lot of this, a lot of that. But like, it was just great to have that moment to say like, I'm okay. I made it. And, um, uh, and there was a little bit of a thank you in that smile too. And so, um, I, those are really good moments that we don't get enough, uh, as administrators. Yeah. That's neat. I love Panera by the way. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's a great place. Um, what, what do you think is the difference between the impact you had as a teacher versus the impact you have now as an administrator? Yeah, well, I, I go back to say, like, I don't ever think I was a very good teacher. Um, I, I, I never really honed that craft. I felt like I was still in that survival mode of that first couple years of teaching. Uh, I do think that I had a passion, deep passion for writing. Um, I actually have a degree in journalism. Hmm. 
And so I wanted to give that gift off to students. And uh, I really, really enjoyed the classes where I got to teach writing and teach uh, that process. And um, so I do think that a lot of students grew in enjoying writing uh, and being able to do that. Um, uh, as a leader, and actually in my, my latest role here as the director of innovation for the Afton School District, mm -hmm. I've really been able to see what is possible if you do a couple of things. One, if you tell people yes, and I really talk about building a culture of yes um, a lot around here, and then also sticking almost at nauseum with the idea that we are going to integrate technology for the purposes of kids to create, make, and design. And over the last three years, we've been able to get friction out of the system, say yes to people, and really create this culture where kids are creating, making, and designing. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't be any more proud of the team I work with and the folks that have leaned into that philosophy here. It's been really, really, really good. And um, uh, as I move on in July officially to a new role, um, I, you know, I, this place is going to be great for the next decade uh, because they've bought into that culture. Mm -hmm. So that's the difference, I think between really helping kids be passionate about something and really being able to shift an entire culture, mm. I think, is, is the difference. So kind of digging into that a little bit, if you could expound on what, what is the culture of yes and then what's the significance there? Yeah, and you know, I, I don't, that's again, I don't think I coined that phrase, but I, I really have bought into the idea that, you know, ideas that aren't good will die on their own. And as an administrator, if you are the first time someone brings you an idea and you say, no, I don't think we can do that, or, hey, can we unblock that site? No, we can't do that. Or do we have the budget? No. We, if that's the prevailing attitude of what goes on, then that has a huge ripple effect mm. because not only does it kill that idea, that teacher's going to go back to their department, they're going to go back to the teacher's lounge. And someone's going, I have this great idea. And they're going to say, don't even ask. He's going to say no. Mm. And bad ideas, if you just keep asking questions like, tell me some more about that. Mm -hmm. How would you do that? What are we going to uh, – will die on their own. They don't have to die in the beginning. Mm -hmm. And uh, so when people bring me ideas, the answer is always yes. Um, you know, Can we go visit this school? Yes, let's figure out a way to make that happen. Mm -hmm. Can we try this out? Yes, let's have a pilot. Let's do that. And so – you know, you don't break the bank. You know, certainly we all have budgets to deal with, but we can build that culture of yes and a really genuine excitement around people's ideas. I think that in too many places, folks feel like they are carrying out a script mm -hmm. of how things are supposed to be and they can't insert anything into that that they care about. Um, and that just isn't the case here anymore. Um, I took a you know, uh, with the help of a lot of folks, uh, a district that felt a very kind of inferiority complex, like, hey, we're good, we'll always be good. And I'm like, why? We can be the best in the state at that. Let's go for it. Mm. Um, and that energy, enthusiasm, and then just saying yes has made a big, big difference. What's the greatest impact that, that has developed as a result of that culture? Just like the willingness to be innovative and try new things, you think? Yeah, and, you know, on, on three things, you know, I, I certainly brought a new layer of technology to the whole district, but that isn't it at all. It's when you walk through our makerspace for kindergartners, first and second grade, that they all have as a special right next to art, music, and PE, they have makerspace. And those kids are playing and being creative and solving problems. I know that five years out, 10 years out, when those kids are juniors and seniors, that's going to make a huge difference in how things work. Hmm. And then the second piece of that is we were really intentional about changing our learning spaces. And that's a big passion for me. And actually, I'm doing a lot of writing. My next couple books are about learning spaces. But they're coming out and saying, like, you know what? We have to have brain-friendly classrooms. We have to have places that spark curiosity. Mm. And so if you walk through all of our buildings now, we have – uh, some are library spaces, some are old computer labs, some are classrooms that people are going, wow, I want my space to look more like that. And we've been able to do it on a budget, which mm -hmm. I think is also a piece of the puzzle. So um, that, that's those two things I really, really think have made us different than just another district that's 
added technology to the mix. Yeah. Well, it sounds like you'd be able to do some things through that culture of yes, that other people probably just, they just dismissed it. So one of the advantages I would guess for developing that culture is like, let's, you know, instead of just shooting down every idea or one that maybe sounds crazy, let's explore that. Like, let's see, maybe that is possible. And let's, let's see if we can figure out a way to make that happen instead of just automatically saying, oh, that sounds like a crazy idea. There's no way that would ever happen. Yeah, exactly. And the other, the other piece that is so essential and, and, you know, it's called tall poppy syndrome. And, uh, if you don't know that my friend in New Zealand said, oh yeah, we're a whole country that does that. If someone sticks their head up and does something wonderful, we chop it off. Mm. And I think that in schools, if you've ever been a part of the teacher of the year process and how uncomfortable that is in buildings, Mm -hmm. whether that's before, during, or after the selection, um, healthy cultures point to people that are doing awesome things and everyone celebrates that. No one says, oh, they need to get back in line or they're making me look bad or, you know, they need to knock it off trying to show me up over there. They're genuinely supportive of really incredible, outstanding teachers and projects and things that are happening. Mm -hmm. And um, we've been really intentional about communicating that, telling that story and making sure that that's in our social media feed across the district as well. Yeah, that's great. That is great. So I'm gonna I'm about to roll through some rapid fire questions. If you're ready. Okay, I actually have them in front of me. I, I thought <laughs> okay, there's great. no way I need to have these in front of me to be ready. So, <laughs> so the first one. What is the best leadership advice you've ever received? That it is truly about being a servant. Your job is to serve other people. And um, putting that into everything you do is super important. Hmm. What would you say is your biggest strength as a school administrator? Um, I think I'm courageous. I think I'm willing to take risks. I'm wi- there are things that I'm willing to get fired for that are so important to me that I would not compromise on those, including lots of issues around education equity. Hmm. I love that. I love that. Uh, so... Aside from your own books, obviously, <laughs> Fair enough. which, which, you know, of course, everybody that's listening should go out and buy those. But in addition, do you have a book or two that has helped shape you or that you would recommend for other school leaders? Yeah, one of those is Make Space, which came out of the Stanford Design School and talks about learning space design. So I think that's a, a, a really, really important book. And then a book that I go back to, and I'm surprised that I'm mentioning this, but I go back to it, is The Art and Science of Teaching, the Marzano book. Hmm. Um, I really, really have now truly bought into this idea that we have to cultivate both the science of teaching and knowing the research and doing that piece and understanding best practice, Hmm. but also cultivating the art of teaching and being able to allow people to have the space to create um, just like we're creating those spaces for kids to create, make and design. We have to create spaces um, for teachers to be able to raise their level as an artisan, as a teacher. Right. Instead of like you were talking about earlier, instead of everything seeming like it's got to be scripted, right? Yeah. Yeah. Right. Uh, Is there a technology tool or an app or software that you'd recommend to other school leaders? Oh, so many. Uh, The one that popped in my head, I really like Edpuzzle lately. Mm -hmm. And there's a couple of things that do that, but we have to teach kids how to digest video in an intellectual way. We have a lot of passive ingestion Mm -hmm. of video for kids. Uh, And there's a couple of sites, but that one popped in my head that allows teachers to slow kids down, interject ideas while kids are watching video. We're such a video-driven society. We have to be able to figure out how to learn that way as well. It's called Ed Puzzle. Ed Puzzle, yeah. Ed Puzzle. Okay. And there's a few things that do what Ed Puzzle does, but um, I, I, I like that one. Okay. What is your favorite educational quote? This one's hard for me. I'm not a quote person, but I'm looking for a quote on my desk. So I'm going <laughs> to go with the fact that there are no limits but the sky and Cervantes said that. Oh, okay. Great. Um, what advice do you have with working with the students that you serve in, you know, in your school? Yeah. You know, uh, Afton is a very unique place. We have the, one of the largest home 
of Bosnians outside of Bosnia. Huh. And so we one of the f- few school, maybe the only school in the country that has a Bosnian studies program in their huh. high school. So I just think like there is unique beautiful culture in every school if we allow ourselves to lean into it and we have so much to learn about culture and about um, the way that kids live and I, I think we don't lean in even when we try to lean into it I'm not sure we lean into it as much as we can hmm. um, just finished le- uh, reading the book um, Between the World and Me hmm. uh, which has just won a bunch of awards but it talks about schooling in Baltimore and what that student had to go through just to exist in the community. And so um, I, I think that's a really, really important piece of the puzzle. Hmm. What one piece of advice would you have for working with the educators that you lead, like the other teachers? Yeah. Assume best intentions always, mm. that people are working really hard every day for kids and that the change that needs to be made is oftentimes about things that they don't know yet. And so if you can assume those best intentions and really feel like you're helping to help folks do things different instead of asking people to do things more, uh, because no one has time to do more, Mm -hmm. but I think that folks have time to do things different and probably a responsibility to do things differently. And so I kind of take that lens into my work with all the adults that I work with. Hmm. What's the best way to connect with you? Yeah, two things. Um, all of my work and my blog and my website is drrobertdillon.com. And then also um, I'm at ideaguy42 on Twitter. And so I'm, I'm close to giving that up. I think it needs to change, but I've been there since 2009. So it's hard to give up seven years of being at ideaguy42. <laughs> Well, I, I was apparently not the first Jay Willis to ever use most of the social media platforms that I'm on. So unfortunately, I had to be Jay Willis one in lots of places. So Yeah. And so yeah, it works, you know, yeah. as long as people know where to find you. Right? That's right. That's right. So last question. And this one's kind of, uh, it, you know, it might catch you off guard a little bit, but it's a it's a I think it's a good question for our listeners to just be able to hear the answer to just if you could go back. And to when you were a teacher and had just made the decision to move into school leadership, if you could talk to your younger self, what advice would you give yourself? Yeah. Um, I didn't take time to listen to the wisdom of the veteran teachers. Um, Mm -hmm. Even folks that are in their final years and may not be knocking it out of the park in the classroom, even though I've worked with some great final year teachers, um, take those folks to lunch, take a walk on the track with them, whatever that is, but be willing to humble yourself to the potential that their story holds wisdom for your career. Mm. That's great. Learn from the experience and wisdom of others. That's great. Yeah. Very and, good. You know, I, I, I feel like I was a little too arrogant at the time to be able to uh, know that nugget. Yeah. I think most of us are, you know, like when we're first starting yeah. off and we just, we're young, we think we, we're invincible and just that willingness to be humble enough to admit you don't know everything and learn from like the wisdom and experience of others is such a valuable thing. Yeah. That's great. Well, thank you very much. Eduleaders, this has been a great interview today. Uh, For the show notes of today's show and other resources, visit educatorslead.com and type the word Bob into the search tool to find his show notes. Bob, thank you for sharing your journey with us today. And that wraps up another episode of Educators Lead. This podcast is brought to you by Mometrics, the number one test preparation company. Mometrics offers study materials for over 1,800 different exams, including the SAT, ACT, GED, end-of-course exams, state standard exams like the STAR, teacher certification exams, advanced placement, CLEP, ASVAB, GRE, and so many more. Mometrics takes the mountains of information students could be tested over for any given exam and boils it all down to just the fluff-free golden nuggets of information that are most likely to be on the exam. 
They couple that with some great study tips and test-taking strategies to help students maximize their test scores. With their interactive tutorial videos and a layout that makes lesson planning easy, Mometric study guides, flashcards, and practice questions are a great fit for individual or classroom use. To learn more about our products and our vault of hundreds of free tutorial videos, please visit educatorslead.com forward slash test prep. That's educatorslead.com forward slash test prep. Edu leaders, thank you for joining us on Educators Lead. Visit us at educatorslead.com for everything we talked about today, free resources, and much, much more.